of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. I'd like to tell you a little something about the harp today and my role within the orchestra. So this is the modern concert harp. It's just under two metres tall and it weighs around 38 kilograms, so it's quite heavy. The main part of the instrument, as you can see, is the set of strings. Uh, there are 47 of them in total. Uh, you might already have noticed that they're different colours. That's just a visual thing so that harpists um, can find their way around the instrument. Um, all the red strings are C's and all the black strings are F's. The range of the harp is from a C, three octaves below middle C, up to a G, three and a half octaves above middle C. Between the C's and the F's I have what equates to a diatonic scale. <laughs> If you like it's like the white notes of the piano now to get the other chromatic notes i need to use the pedals at my feet i've got seven pedals one for each note in the scale and my left foot operates the d c and b pedal and my right foot operates e f g and a pedals these pedals each of them has a metal rod which runs through the pillar and then connect to a series of moving plates within the neck of the harp. Um, those moving plates then connect to all the discs that you can see at the front of the harp. And I've got two discs for each string. So what the pedal does is when I move it, if it's in the top position, which is the flats, there are no discs attached to the string. So I get a C flat. If I move the pedal into the middle position, it moves this disc here, which stops this part of the string from sounding. So the string goes up a semitone to a C natural. And then the same thing happens if I move the pedal into the bottom position. It moves this disc and stops this part of the string moving again. And so the string becomes a C sharp. <clears throat> now, as I said, I have one pedal for each note. So when I move a pedal, for example, again, the C, it moves every single C string on the harp. The exceptions to this are the two strings at the bottom, the bottom C and the bottom D, which I have to tune according to what the composer or arranger has asked for. And the lowest note that I can really get is a C flat, so a B natural. Um, and then the very top string, which is the G at the top. So I can only get one note of that string at the top. I should say that there is a new harp out by Lion and Healy, the American harp company, where they do have the discs on the top string. Um, but unless you actually know the harpist that you're writing for and you know that um, they've got that harp, it's worth um, erring on the cautious side and still only writing um, either a, a G or a G sharp for the top string. I don't mention the, the G flat only because I could use an F sharp instead so, um, but that's something I'll talk about now. Um, basically what happens is um, on the piano, you could write a C with a C sharp at different places in the, in the range of the piano. On the harp, if you write a C note for us, we read it as something to be played on the C string. So if you write a C natural and a C sharp, say within the same chord, for a harpist, that doesn't make sense because, as I said, with the pedals, you can only have either a C natural or a C sharp. You can't have both. Um, so we have to play a D flat instead because for us, for example, again, the C sharp is on the C string and the D flat is on the D string. Unlike the piano, which, of course, is the same key for both of them. Um, so I can play, as I say, not a C and a C sharp, but I can play a C and a D flat. The complications come if you think that we can play a C and a C sharp and then write, say, a D natural, perhaps to be played at the same time, or you ask for something else um, that will require a lot of pedal changes and a lot of adaption because 
as I say, there's a limit to what we can get on each string at any one time. Um, you'll just see some music, I hope, coming up on your screen now, uh, which is um, a little extract from the Delius Dance Rhapsody number no. two. Um, this is a very chromatic writing. Interestingly, he writes the same thing for the Celeste, which of course is much easier because the notes are there. On the harp, we have to find a lot of them. And you'll see how the score is written and also the harp part that's written where the harpist has had to adapt and play a lot of enharmonic notes instead to try to create the same harmonies. And it's much, much more complicated than if the notes are already there and available um, for us to play without having to think about the pedal changes. Um, so that's basically how the harp works. Um, sometimes people say to me, well, how do, how do the strings attach uh, to the harp? And um, what happens, this is the soundboard, which is hollow. Um, in front of me, so at the back of the soundboard, there are lots of gaps where I can thread the strings through. And as you'll see, there are lots of holes um, for all the different strings in the middle of the soundboard. So the strings thread through there and then they go up to the tuning pins, which they're wound around. And I use my tuning key to tune them up. Um, 47 strings takes a little while to tune. And um, when I'm going on tour with the orchestra and the harps have to travel in their flight cases to different countries, uh, they have to deal with different air conditioning in different concert halls, they're often on the road, um, particularly if the orchestra's uh, working uh, for a certain amount of time, they tend to be travelling most days, um, so obviously the instruments go with us. And um, this instrument, uh, because of the way it's built, uh, there are, as I say, there are a lot of moving parts. There are actually nearly 1400 moving parts in total in this harp. Um, and they're all metal, um, and metal reacts differently to heat and to cold than wood does. So there's a lot of pressure, there are a lot of constrict conflicting things that are going on within the instrument itself. So as you can imagine, um, when you get to a concert hall, the harp's been on the road, it's been subject, as I say, to all these different pressures. Uh, tuning can become quite tricky and a lot of strings can also just break just because of the pressure that the instrument's under. Um, so that in itself can be quite complicated um, for us. It involves a, a bit more time uh, to be spent with the actual instrument, preparing it and getting it ready. Uh, for the concerts and for the rehearsals. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the harp um, because it's really very interesting what's happened, how the harp has developed over time um, and understanding the changes that have happened and the things that manufacturers have tried to do in creating different instruments helps to explain why we've ended up with the instrument that we've ended up with. The harp adds another texture to the sound world of the orchestra, but in order to talk a little bit more about its role, I need to say something about the history. It's one of the oldest instruments, and there are many, many depictions of it in ancient civilizations. Um, the harp was a very small framed instrument originally, and continued to be so actually until probably around the 14th century, when a new harp was developed in Ireland which had a much sturdier frame, and for the first time the soundboard was able to be hollowed out. Of course, um, the harp continued to develop, even as a very small instrument that it was, and by the 16th century harp makers were trying to find a way to increase the number of notes that could be got out of the instrument. Um, so two harps were um, developed, one the double strung harp, which had two rows of strings coming out of the soundboard, and every string was tuned to a different note. And then the triple strung harp, which had three rows of strings, the outer two rows had, were tuned diatonically, and then the extra semitones were played in the middle row of strings. As you can imagine, uh, this was a very popular instrument at the time, because for the first time uh, within the range that the harp had, every single chromatic note was available. Monteverdi used it in his new operas, and Handel wrote a harp concerto for it. Um, interestingly enough, actually, if you look in the score, uh, the orchestral writing is pretty minimal. And of course, that's because the harp, even though it was fully chromatic, it was still a very small instrument, so it wasn't able to project very far. Um, and actually, there are a lot of passages in the concerto where the harp is just playing on its own. It was popular in the royal courts and palaces, so it was a great success at that time. 
Um, sadly, as far as orchestral playing goes, it wasn't it wasn't used. I mean, the, the harp was really not considered an orchestral instrument at that time. It was too small and it couldn't compete against the sound. Um, and I would say the tuning was a problem. Um, so against other other instruments, it just didn't work. Um, so harp makers were still trying to find better ways to increase the sound, to increase the number of notes that were available and lose the tuning problems. Now, if you think of any stringed instrument, um, any player will change the notes on the strings by using their fingers um, to stop the string and uh, make the sound higher. So harp manufacturers were looking at whether there was any way to do this on the harp. And in Austria in the 17th century, a new harp came out, which was known as the hook harp, which had hooks at the top of the strings, which did the same as the fingers for the string players. It stopped the string. You turned the hook with your hand and it stopped the string. So it made the string go up by a semitone. Um, this again was a great success, but of course what it did mean was that the harpist was having to use their hands to change the notes, so it was quite restrictive. Um, in 1720, a Bavarian harp maker, Josef Hochbrucker, developed this idea of, instead of the harpist using their hands, being able to use pedals at their feet, and this was fantastic. Um, it obviously freed up the hands, it meant that for the first time there were semitones available on each string. Um, so, but the trouble with this was that, of course, um, any system that isn't absolutely direct is going to create some problems. So what you had with the mechanism was you would play the string in its natural form, but then if the hooks didn't attach properly, you would have wasn't entirely <coughs> successful of course. So uh, after this time manufacturers were all trying to find different more successful ways of being able to stop the string, um, being able to make it work better, keeping the tuning better of course. Um, and so the hooks became levers, there was then a new system called fourchette where there were two prongs that moved to cross over the string to stop it um, from uh, buzzing. Um, and of course, there was then this idea that actually, if you can do one semitone, why not do two semitones? So during that time, about the late um, middle, middle of the 18th century, a harp with 14 pedals was made, um, two sets of pedals, uh, one on top of the other. Um, I, I have no idea how anybody managed to play that. I find it hard enough with seven pedals. I don't, I don't know how anyone would play with 14. Um, reminds me a bit of organists. I don't know how they, they do it either. It's extraordinary. Um, but um, what had then happened was at the end of the 18th century, a new um, French harp and piano manufacturer came up with this idea, first of all, he painted a new system, which was a plate with two prongs um, attached to it. And it was the plate that moved rather than the hooks or the levers or the fourchette system. Um, and it's exactly the same as what we have here. Um, so the prongs are completely stable and that helped to stop the string from buzzing. Um, so in, um, at the end of the 18th century, as I say, he patented his new harp, um, the single action pedal harp, which had this um, disc system on it. And then a few years later in 1810, he patented what became known as the double action harp, which is the basis of what we have today, whereby he had, rather than 14 pedals, he had seven pedals, but with two notches on them, as I've explained to you right at the very beginning of this talk. Um, so for the first time, you had two sets of discs which ran down, which were all connected to the same pedal. Um, so you could have the C flat, C natural, C sharp, two semitones on every string. Now, as you can imagine, again, this was a huge thing, um, very, very popular. Every harpist was just amazed that suddenly here was this instrument. You'd had to pre-tune um, the single action harps um, to what you needed, because obviously 
uh, you had to tune in a certain key according to what semitones you needed. Here was a harp you could just tune diatonically and then you had every note available to you. It said that in the first year that Sebastian Erard was selling these harps, he made £25,000, um, which I think in today's money is just under £2 million. Um, I'm sorry if I'm wrong, but I think it's something like that. So uh, yeah, it was, it was very successful. Um, but what this meant in terms of orchestral playing, of course, was that suddenly you had this harp available that had much more variety in what it could actually play, what it could produce. Um, and Berlioz, who was the very first harp, um, composer to write for the harp, he met uh, one of the famous harpists of the time, English harpist Elias Parrish Alvars, and was astonished by what could be produced from this new double action harp. So he began writing for the harp in the orchestra and he really thought of the harp as a bit of a feature um, and again because the sound was still very very quiet he would request and you can find it in his scores he would request multiple harps or as many harps as possible um, and in his book about orchestral writing he actually says it's much better to have multiple harps because the sound is so different it's much better, it projects much further, and it's much more beautiful than just one harp on its own. Um, I love when we do Berlioz, particularly during the proms actually at the Albert Hall stage, because there's more room, so we're able to have more harps. Um, and it's lovely, because a lot of the time the harp is on its own. Um, I think I'm lucky in the symphony orchestra that a lot of the repertoire that we do does require two harps, but inevitably I do still spend a lot of time just on my own. Um, so it's really, really lovely when you do get a section of harps coming in to play something and it changes the sound. As I say, there's nothing like hearing 10 or 12 harps playing together um, and knowing that that sound is really projecting and sounding beautiful. Um, Tchaikovsky um, also began to realise what the double action harp can do. And the one thing he made a lot of was this effect known as the glissando. Um, I've already talked about the fact that for us a C sharp and a D flat is a different string. Well, of course, if you think about, you can double up in harmonics. So say you have a C sharp, D flat, F sharp, G flat, A sharp and a B flat you can immediately create a chord. And if you change the pedals, you change the sound of that chord. Now Tchaikovsky uses this to great effect in some of his symphonic writing. Um, and in fact, in Manfred, he wrote a cadenza for two harps, which was predominantly, predominantly glissandi. Um, so that was really, really lovely that um, composers were beginning to see that you could use the harp in an orchestral setting. I should say that um, Tchaikovsky also wrote cadenzas for the harp in all of his ballets. Um, and they're very well known. At the time, he left it quite free for the harpist to decide exactly what to play. He wrote a sort of a framework, if you like, of the cadenzas. So, <clears throat> for example, the Nutcracker cadenza, there are lots and lots and lots of different variations on the cadenza um, that can be accessed throughout the world. A lot of harpists have, have, have written a cadenza for that. So as far as orchestral playing uh, went at this time, both Debussy and Ravel, because of the nature of the music that they were writing, they both wrote for the pedal harp because they loved this effect of the glissandi. Um, the other thing that they particularly liked was the harmonic, um, which is quite a common effect um, on the harp. a very ringing tone and a lot of composers like to use it also it's slightly um it's a slightly different sound on the harp so i'm just going to play you as just an example of uh, some of the writing i'm just going to play you the beginning of the harp cadenza from ravel's piano concerto in g just so you can hear the sort of sound world that they were creating for the harp in the orchestral writing so 
just in talking about those four composers, it's easy to see how the double action pedal harp was fundamental to the harp being able to become part of the orchestra. And even just talking about them, Berlioz using the harp as a feature instrument, Tchaikovsky using it as a soloist, and then Ravel and Debussy using all the sort of beautiful sounds that the harp can create as an extra colour and an extra texture to all their writing. So you can see that the role of the harp, even during that short period of time, has changed. Um, for a while, of course, the um, composers were thrilled to have this new instrument that could create lots of different effects, and a lot of them did use the glissandi extensively. Um, one really good and beautiful example, I think, is at the end of Planets by Holst, um, where there is this sort of outer worldly atmosphere being created by the offstage lady singers. And the two harps are accompanying them effectively with two different glissandi. Harp one has got a glissando in one key, harp two has got a glissando to play in another key. And it just creates this sort of ethereal, as I say, outer world atmosphere. And I think this is what the composers really thought was perfect for the harp. Um, I talked a little bit um, before about the difficulties for taking the harp on tour and um, the fact that strings will break and I need a bit more time sometimes just to tune it and prepare it. So um, I have a string bag that I take everywhere with me uh, which has many sets of strings in it, um, particularly for touring. But in that string bag I also have a pencil case which is full of various objects that I've used over the years um, to create different effects, uh, which is what composers tend to ask for nowadays. There's a lot more experimentation going on with the different things that the harp can do. I've been very lucky. I joined the orchestra in 1990, so I feel very, very privileged. I've played a lot of new music in that time and um, been able to work with many, many composers, um, who, some of whom have also come in and conducted the orchestra. And um, I've been able to talk to a lot of them about exactly what it is that they want, um, what they're looking for, the sort of sounds and effects um, that they're hoping to hear. So I just want to talk through a few of those now. So before I start talking through some of the effects that I have um, in the pencil case, I'm just going to talk about some of the more common effects that I've uh, ended up having to use a lot over the time that I've been in the orchestra. Um, the first one of these is the pedal buzz. Um, and of course, when I talked earlier about the harps that were being developed, uh, one of the main problems with them was the fact that the strings buzzed because the hooks or the levers or even some of the later discs didn't always connect properly onto the strings, which created this buzzing noise. Um, of course, the mechanism has been very, very refined um, to today and the whole point of it is that it's very, very precise, the pedals are spring-loaded, and at, at some point the mechanism will lock into place onto those strings in order to stop the strings from buzzing. So actually to create a pedal buzz these days isn't actually that easy. Um, it's quite a visual thing, you have to actually look at the discs to make sure that they've moved far enough round on the pedal, but not so far that they lock into place. So you create this sound and um, it's a very effective sound if it's used with the percussion or with other instruments that are doing something that has that similar sort of timbre to it. It really is a good, good sound to make within the orchestra. Um, and also I think what's quite nice about it is it's not always clear that it's coming from the harp. Um, so there's just this sort of sense of, oh, where, where is that sound? Um, it's really good. Anyway, uh, so that's the pedal bars. Um, and as I said, they're always much more effective down on, on the bass wires rather than up on the, up on the gut strings. Um, so the other very common things that we tend to do, um, we play near the soundboard, which is an effect called predlatar, which is a bit more like a guitar. Um, and that sounds a bit like this. Play with nails. Um, Marla was somebody who really liked that 
that sound um, of the nails. We can also play um, nails pre de la table. Um, Stravinsky was also somebody who really liked to use these effects, this different sort of pre de la table, and very staccato notes that he liked. We don't have any damping pedals, so we damp everything with our fingers. Um, so th this sort of thing from Stravinsky. <laughs> was a fact that he very much liked to use. Um, so those are sort of the main things. Um, as far as the glisses go, of course, we can do glisses with our nails as well. And we can do sort of chordal glisses. Um, I always know if, um, if I've got a lot of glisses to play, either normal ones with Debussy and Ravel or um, that era of composers, or with the nail glisses, I've got to start practicing them a little while before we play them because they have, they're quite hard work on your nails and on your fingers. I think many, any guitarists that you know will always say, oh, my nail's broken or something has gone wrong. And um, so I have to be quite careful if I know I've got a lot of work to do with, with my nails on the harp coming up in the orchestra. I have to be quite careful to look after them, make sure they don't get too long, but not let them be too short. Um, so talking about the nails and the sound that they make, um, there's also um, the sound of plectrums. Um, which is another very common um, thing that we do. So I, I carry plectrums around as any other harpist does, carry plectrums around with me all the time. Um, and we can play glisses, of course, with, with plectrums. Um, just get into a nice key for you. Um, they are not as loud as you might think. Um, if I want to play a really, really loud gliss and I'm asked for a very loud, very hard gliss, I will use um, my leathers, which is just two pieces of leather cut from a, an ordinary leather belt. Um, and they make a much bigger sound. Um, and that carries much better across the orchestra. Of course, it's not at all suitable for the beautiful music of Debussy and Ravel. Uh, that's very much for your fingers to play. But this is, you know, if, if a composer specifically asks for a very hard and very loud sound that the leathers are ideal. Um, so just going back to the plectrums, um, we also can play, um, let's say Marler liked, liked the sound of nails. He, he also gave the option to use plectrums. I think um, most harpists like, prefer to use um, nails, but... the fact you don't have to pick up another um, thing to play with and the nails sound so similar to the black drum means that we tend to prefer the nails. Um, but the other thing that the plectrum can also do is the gliss between the mechanism and the tuning pins. That's a really effective uh, gliss, particularly as I say, a lot of these things are really effective with the percussion. And I often think actually the role of the harp in the orchestra quite often is in addition um, to the percussion section because there are so many percussive things we can actually do. Um, the one thing about this gliss um, is it doesn't work so well down the bottom of the harp. Um, just because the, the strings are further stretched out so or further spaced out um, so you're better off to always say you want the gliss up the top here. Um, so that's those. Then um, just to talk about one other gliss that we play um, which involves uh, the spoons. Um, every harpist will know this one. Um, it's called the Bartok Spoons, this gliss, um, basically because Bartok wrote um, a very metallic sounding gliss effect that he wanted at the end of the first movement of his concerto for orchestra. Um, so um, we tend again, we tend to carry spoons around with us and uh, certainly these ones generally are played for the Bartok. Um, but, you know, there have been other times when a composer has come up and said, I want something that sounds 
quite hard on Metallica, and I've said, well, you know, this is this is something that we do use. Um, and um, again, if you're asking for any of these effects, you just need to remember we need time to pick them up. So, um, so just you know, give us a bar or so, just so that we can actually pick them up and 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 you know, put them into place because they take a, a minute just to set. Um, I've been asked to play uh, this is with shoehorns before now, um, which is um, very interesting. And I think there's more of a visual thing to that uh, than anything else. And then uh, one of the other effects that I've had to play quite a few times over the years is the coin against the metal strings at the bottom. <laughs> Um, to me, it sounds a bit like the nails on the blackboard. It's something that makes you grimace a bit. Um, but you can make a very quick sound, um, which is good for really very modern and sort of almost electronic music. It works really well. Um, and then the last one that I want to talk about really um, is the paper in the strings effect. I think this is a it's a really funny um, effect and. Um, I have some quite funny memories <laughs> of playing it. Um, so this is the sound. So yeah, but it is, it's a really funny and it certainly works well in more sort of comic music. It's a really, really good effect. So I think those are some of the sort of uh, more common effects and some of the funnier ones that I've had to do. We do also have to knock on the soundboard um, on the front and on the back, uh, use knuckles as well as our fingers. Um, it's some, that's something that works uh, in a much quieter setting within the orchestra, so it certainly doesn't work when everyone's playing. And of course, when you've got a very big percussion section, as we do in the symphony orchestra, it's not necessarily always appropriate to write it for the harp, but certainly for quieter moments and something where you think, um, actually, I really like to do that, perhaps with a harmonic. So um, something like that, that sort of thing where you're, as I say, you're, you're playing two sort of different effects at the same time. You know, it's, it's really nice um, and, it, and it just adds that different, slightly different atmosphere. So I suppose having sort of talked about all these things, um, the role of the harp in the orchestra has changed um, such a lot over time. And for sure, as I just said, you know, there are many times when the harp really becomes more part of the percussion section uh, than it does um, being a sort of an accompaniment, um, accompanying instrument um, to the other sections in the orchestra, or even adding that different colour, um, composers such as Ravel and Debussy um, used to such a great extent. Um, and that for me, I think, is one of the lovely things about being an orchestral harpist, that you get to do so many different things on this instrument. And I think the possibilities for the instrument carry on um, being exploited um, by composers even in this present day. Um, for sure, uh, the harp is not fully chromatic, as, as I've already mentioned many times, um, but the advantages to this instrument that we can do so many other things, um, which the harps that were developed over time and then sort of fell out of use, they didn't have those capabilities. And I think this is why we've ended up, this harp has been so successful within the orchestral setting, I think that's why it's remained as it is, and um, I mean, it's possible in the future, maybe a heart manufacturer will develop a new instrument where perhaps we don't need to move pedals to create new notes, perhaps there'll be another system, I don't know, but for sure this is the most successful instrument out of all of the ones that were created, um, and gives the harpist a very, very flexible role, I think, within the orchestral setting. So I really hope that um, you've enjoyed what I've had to say today. Um, just to finish, I'd like to play a little extract from a piece by Takamitsu, um, more than anything because I just love the sound world that he creates. And for me, this is something that is so exceptional. It could only have been written for the harp. So I'm going to finish with that. Mm -hmm. 